to discuss with you the drawing up of a contract for a term of years, say ten, during which we shall have the exclusive rights of publishing in book form all that you produce. But more of this anon. Martin laid down the letter and worked a problem in mental arithmetic, finding the product of 15 cents times 60,000 to be $9,000. He signed the new contract, inserting the smoke of joy in the blank space, and mailed it back to the publishers along with the 20 storyettes he had written in the days before he discovered the formula for the newspaper storyette and promptly as the United States mail could deliver and return, came Singletree, Darnley and Co.'s check for $5,000. I want you to come downtown with me, Maria, this afternoon, about two o'clock, Martin said, the morning the check arrived. Or better, meet me at 14th and Broadway at two o'clock. I'll be looking out for you. At the appointed time, she was there, but shoes was the only clue to the mystery her mind had been capable of evolving, and she suffered a distinct shock of disappointment when Martin walked her right by a shoe store and dived into a real estate office. What happened thereupon resided forever after in her memory as a dream. Fine gentlemen smiled at her benevolently as they talked with Martin and one another. A typewriter clicked. Signatures were affixed to an imposing document. Her own landlord was there too, and affixed his signature. And when all was over, and she was outside on the sidewalk, her landlord spoke to her, saying, Well, Maria, you won't have to pay me no seven dollars and a half this month. Maria was too stunned for speech. Or next month, or the next, or the next, her landlord said. She thanked him incoherently, as if for a favour and it was not until she had returned home to North Oakland and conferred with her own kind and had the Portuguese grocer investigate that she really knew that she was the owner of the little house in which she had lived and for which she had paid rent so long. Why don't you trade with me no more? The Portuguese grocer asked Martin that evening, stepping out to hail him when he got off the car and Martin explained that he wasn't doing his own cooking any more, and then he went in and had a drink of wine on the house. He noted it was the best wine the grocer had in stock. Maria, Martin announced that night, I'm going to leave you, and you're going to leave here yourself soon. Then you can rent the house and be a landlord yourself. You've a brother in San Leandro, or Haywards, and he's in the milk business. I want you to send all your washing back unwashed, understand, unwashed, and go out to San Leandro tomorrow, or Haywards, or wherever it is, and see that brother of yours. Tell him to come to see me. I'll be stopping at the Metropole down in Oakland. He'll know a good milk ranch when he sees one. And so it was that Maria became a landlord, and the sole owner of a dairy, with two hired men to do the work for her, and a bank account that steadily increased, despite the fact that her whole brood wore shoes and went to school. Few persons ever meet the fairy princes they dream about, but Maria, who worked hard and whose head was hard, never dreaming about fairy princes, entertained hers in the guise of an ex-laundryman. In the meantime, the world had begun to ask, Who is this Martin Eden? He had declined to give any biographical data to his publishers, but the newspapers were not to be denied. Oakland was his home town, and the reporters nosed out scores of individuals who could supply information. All that he was and was not, all that he had done and most of what he had not done, was spread out for the delectation of the public, accompanied by snapshots and photographs, the latter procured from the local photographer who had once taken Martin's picture and who promptly copyrighted it and put it on the market. At first, so great was his disgust with the magazines and all bourgeois society, Martin fought against publicity, but in the end, because it was easier than not to, he surrendered. He found that he could not refuse himself to the special writers who travelled long distances to see him. Then again, each day was so many hours long, and since he no longer was occupied with writing and studying, those hours had to be occupied somehow. 
So he yielded to what was to him a whim, permitted interviews, gave his opinions on literature and philosophy, and even accepted invitations of the bourgeoisie. He had settled down into a strange and comfortable state of mind. He no longer cared. He forgave everybody, even the cub reporter who had painted him red and to whom he now granted a full page with specially posed photographs. He saw Lizzie occasionally, and it was patent that she regretted the greatness that had come to him. It widened the space between them. Perhaps it was with the hope of narrowing it that she yielded to his persuasions to go to night school and business college, and to have herself gowned by a wonderful dressmaker who charged outrageous prices. She improved visibly from day to day, until Martin wondered if he was doing right, for he knew that all her compliance and endeavour was for his sake. She was trying to make herself of worth in his eyes, of the sort of worth he seemed to value, yet he gave her no hope, treating her in brotherly fashion and rarely seeing her. Overdue was rushed upon the market by the Meredith Lowell Company in the height of his popularity, and being fiction, in point of sales it made even a bigger strike than The Shame of the Sun. Week after week he was the credit of unprecedented performance of having two books at the head of the list of bestsellers. Not only did the story take with the fiction readers, but those who read The Shame of the Sun with avidity were likewise attracted to the sea story by the cosmic grasp of mastery with which he had handled it. First, he had attacked the literature of mysticism and had done it exceedingly well, and next he had successfully supplied the very literature he had exposited, thus proving himself to be that rare genius, a critic and a creator in one. Money poured in on him, fame poured in on him, he flashed, comet-like through the world of literature, and he was more amused than interested by the stir he was making. One thing was still puzzling him, a little thing that would have puzzled the world had it known, but the world would have puzzled over his bepuzzlement rather than over the little thing that to him loomed gigantic. Judge Blount invited him to dinner. That was the little thing, or the beginning of the little thing that was soon to become the big thing. He had insulted Judge Blount, treated him abominably, and Judge Blount, meeting him on the street, invited him to dinner. Martin bethought himself of the numerous occasions on which he had met Judge Blount at the Morses, and when Judge Blount had not invited him to dinner. Why had he not invited him to dinner then? he asked himself. He had not changed. He was the same Martin Eden. What made the difference? The fact that the stuff he had written had appeared inside the covers of books? But it was work performed. It was not something he had done since. It was achievement accomplished at the very time Judge Blount was sharing this general view and sneering at his Spencer and his intellect. Therefore, it was not for any real value but for a purely fictitious value that Judge Blount invited him to dinner. Martin grinned and accepted the invitation, marvelling the while at his complacence. And at the dinner, where, with their womankind, were half a dozen of those that sat in high places, and where Martin found himself quite the lion, Judge Blount, warmly seconded by Judge Hamwell, urged privately that Martin should permit his name to be put up for the sticks the ultra-select club to which belonged not the mere men of wealth, but the men of attainment. And Martin declined, and was more puzzled than ever. He was kept busy disposing of his heap of manuscripts. He was overwhelmed by requests from editors. It had been discovered that he was a stylist, with meat under his style. The Northern Review, after publishing The Cradle of Beauty, had written him for half a dozen similar essays, which would have been supplied out of the heap had not Burton's magazine, in a speculative mood, offered him five hundred dollars each for five essays. He wrote back that he would supply the demand, but at a thousand dollars an essay. He remembered that all these manuscripts had been refused by the very magazines that were now clamouring for them, and their refusals had been cold-blooded, 
automatic, stereotyped. They had made him sweat, and now he intended to make them sweat. Burton's magazine paid his price for five essays, and the remaining four, at the same rate, were snapped up by Macintosh's monthly, the Northern Review being too poor to stand the pace. Thus went out to the world the high priests of mystery, the wonder dreamers, the art stick of the ego, philosophy of illusion, God and Claude, art and biology, critics and test tubes, stardust and the dignity of usury, to raise storms and rumblings and mutterings that were many a day in dying down. Editors wrote to him telling him to name his own terms, which he did, but it was always for work performed. He refused resolutely to pledge himself to any new thing. The thought of again setting pen to paper maddened him. He had seen Brissenden torn to pieces by the crowd, and despite the fact that him the crowd acclaimed, he could not get over the shock nor gather any respect for the crowd. His very popularity seemed a disgrace and a treason to Brissenden. It made him wince, but he made up his mind to go on and fill the money bag. He received letters from editors like the following. About a year ago, we were unfortunate enough to refuse your collection of love poems. We were greatly impressed by them at the time, but certain arrangements already entered into prevented our taking them. If you still have them, and if you will be kind enough to forward them, we shall be glad to publish the entire collection on your own terms. We are also prepared to make a most advantageous offer for bringing them out in book form. Martin recollected his blank verse tragedy and sent it instead. He read it over before mailing and was particularly impressed by its sophomoric amateurishness and general worthlessness, but he sent it and it was published to the everlasting regret of the editor. The public was indignant and incredulous. It was too far a cry from Martin Eden's high standard to that serious bosh. It was asserted that he had never written it, that the magazine had faked it very clumsily, or that Martin Eden was emulating the elder Dumas and at the height of success was hiring his writing done for him. But when he explained that the tragedy was an early effort of his literary childhood and that the magazine had refused to be happy unless it got it, a great laugh went up at the magazine's expense and a change in the editorship followed. The tragedy was never brought out in book form, though Martin pocketed the advance royalties that had been paid. Coleman's Weekly sent Martin a lengthy telegram, costing nearly $300, offering him $1,000 an article for 20 articles. He was to travel over the United States with all expenses paid and select whatever topics interested him. The body of the telegram was devoted to hypothetical topics in order to show him the freedom of range that was to be his. The only restriction placed upon him was that he must confine himself to the United States. Martin sent his inability to accept and his regrets by wire, collect. Wiki Wiki, published in Warren's Monthly, was an instantaneous success. It was brought out forward in a wide-margined, beautifully decorated volume that struck the holiday trade and sold like wildfire. The critics were unanimous in the belief that it would take its place with those two classics by two great writers, The Bottle Imp and The Magic Skin. The public, however, received the Smoke of Joy collection rather jubilously and coldly. The audacity and unconventionality of the storyettes was a shock to the bourgeois morality and prejudice. But when Paris went mad over the immediate translation that was made, the American and English reading public followed suit and bought so many copies that Martin compelled the conservative house of Singletree, Darnley & Co. to pay a flat royalty of 25% for a third book and 30% flat for a fourth. These two volumes comprised all the short stories he had written and which had received, or were receiving, serial publication. The Ring of Bells and his horror stories constituted one collection. The other collection was composed of Adventure, The Pot, The Wine of Life, The Whirlpool, 
The Jostling Street, and four other stories. The Lowell Meredith Company captured the collection of all his essays, and the Maximilian Company got his sea lyrics and the love cycle, the latter receiving serial publication in the Ladies' Home Companion after the payment of an extortionate price. Martin heaved a sigh of relief when he had disposed of the last manuscript. The grass-walled castle and the white-coppered schooner were very near to him. Well, at any rate, he had discovered Brissenden's contention that nothing of merit found its way into the magazines. His own success demonstrated that Brissenden had been wrong. And yet, somehow, he had a feeling that Brissenden had been right after all. The shame of the sun had been the cause of his success more than the stuff he had written. That stuff had been merely incidental. It had been rejected right and left by the magazines. The publication of The Shame of the Sun had started a controversy and precipitated the landslide in his favour. Had there been no Shame of the Sun, there would have been no landslide. And had there been no miracle in the go of The Shame of the Sun, there would have been no landslide. Singletree, Darnley and Co. attested that miracle. They had brought out a first edition of 1,500 copies and been dubious of selling it. They were experienced publishers, and no one had been more astounded than they at the success which had followed. To them, it had been in truth a miracle. They never got over it, and every letter they wrote him reflected their reverent awe of that first mysterious happening. They did not attempt to explain it. There was no explaining it. It had happened. In the face of all experience to the contrary, it had happened. So it was, reasoning thus, that Martin questioned the validity of his popularity. It was the bourgeoisie that bought his books and poured its gold into his money sack, and from what little he knew of the bourgeoisie, it was not clear to him how it could possibly appreciate or comprehend what he had written. His intrinsic beauty and power meant nothing to the hundreds of thousands who were acclaiming him and buying his books. He was the fad of the hour, the adventurer who had stormed Parnassus while the gods nodded. The hundreds of thousands read him and acclaimed him with the same brute non-understanding with which they had flung themselves on Brissenden's ephemera and torn it to pieces. A wolf rabble that fawned on him instead of fanging him. Fawn or fang, it was all a matter of chance. One thing he knew with absolute certitude, ephemera was infinitely greater than anything he had done. It was infinitely greater than anything he had in him. It was a poem of centuries. Then the tribute that the mob paid him was a sorry tribute indeed, for that same mob had wallowed ephemera into the mire. He sighed heavily and with satisfaction. He was glad the last manuscript was sold and that he would soon be done with it all. Chapter 44 Mr. Morse met Martin in the office of the Hotel Metropole. Whether he had happened there just casually, intent on other affairs, or whether he had come there for the direct purpose of inviting him to dinner, Martin could never quite make up his mind though he inclined toward the second hypothesis. At any rate, invited to dinner he was by Mr. Morse, Ruth's father, who had forbidden him the house and broken off the engagement. Martin was not angry. He was not even on his dignity. He tolerated Mr. Morse, wondering the while how it felt to eat such humble pie. He did not decline the invitation, Instead, he put it off with vagueness and indefiniteness and inquired after the family, particularly after Mrs. Morse and Ruth. He spoke her name without hesitancy, naturally, though secretly surprised that he had had no inward quiver, no old familiar increase of pulse and warm surge of blood. He had many invitations to dinner, some of which he accepted, Persons got themselves introduced to him in order to invite him to dinner, and he went on puzzling over the little thing that was becoming a great thing. Bernard Higginbotham invited him to dinner. He puzzled the harder. 
He remembered the days of his desperate starvation when no one invited him to dinner. That was the time he needed dinners and went weak and faint for lack of them and lost weight from sheer famine. That was the paradox of it. When he wanted dinners, no one gave them to him. And now that he could buy a hundred thousand dinners and was losing his appetite, dinners were thrust upon him right and left. But why? There was no justice in it, no merit on his part. He was no different. All the work he had done was even at that time work performed. Mr. and Mrs. Morse had condemned him for an idler and a shirk, and, through Ruth, had urged that he take a clerk's position in an office. Furthermore, they had been aware of his work performed. Manuscript after manuscript of his had been turned over to them by Ruth, they had read them. It was the very same work that had put his name in all the papers, and it was his name being in all the papers that led them to invite him. One thing was certain. The Morses had not cared to have him for himself or for his work. Therefore, they could not want him now for himself or for his work, but for the fame that was his, because he was somebody amongst men. And why not? because he had a hundred thousand dollars or so? That was the way bourgeois society valued a man, and who was he to expect it otherwise? But he was proud. He disdained such valuation. He desired to be valued for himself, or for his work, which, after all, was an expression of himself. That was the way Lizzie valued him. The work with her did not even count. She valued him, himself. That was the way Jimmy, the plumber, and all the old gang valued him. That had been proved often enough in the days when he ran with them. It had been proved that Sunday at Shellmound Park. His work could go hang. What they liked and were willing to scrap for was just Mart Eden, one of the bunch and a pretty good guy. Then there was Ruth. She had liked him for himself. That was indisputable. And yet, much as she liked him, she had liked the bourgeois standard of valuation more. She had opposed his writing, and principally, it seemed to him, because it did not earn money. That had been her criticism of his love cycle. She, too, had urged him to get a job. It was true she refined it to position, but it meant the same thing. And in his own mind, the old nomenclature stuck. He had read her all he wrote, poems, stories, essays, Wiki Wiki, The Shame of the Sun, everything. And she had always and consistently urged him to get a job, to go to work, good God, as if he hadn't been working, robbing sleep, exhausting life in order to be worthy of her. So the little thing grew bigger. He was healthy and normal ate regularly, slept long hours, and yet the growing little thing was becoming an obsession. Work performed. The phrase haunted his brain. He sat opposite Bernard Higginbotham at a heavy Sunday dinner over Higginbotham's cash door, and it was all he could do to restrain himself from shouting out, It was work performed, and now you feed me, when then you let me starve forbade me your house and damned me because I wouldn't get a job and the work was already done, all done and now when I speak you check the thought unuttered on your lips and hang on my lips and pay respectful attention to whatever I choose to say. I tell you your party is rotten and filled with grafters and instead of flying into a rage you hum and whore and admit there is a great deal in what I say. And why? Because I'm famous? Because I've a lot of money? Not because I'm Martin Eaton, a pretty good fellow and not particularly a fool. I could tell you the moon is made of green cheese and you would subscribe to the notion. At least you would not repudiate it because I've got dollars, mountains of them, and it was all done long ago. It was work performed, I tell you when you spat upon me as the dirt under your feet. But Martin did not shout out. The thought gnawed in his brain, an unceasing torment, 
while he smiled and succeeded in being tolerant. As he grew silent, Bernard Higginbotham got the reins and did the talking. He was a success himself and proud of it. He was self-made. No one had helped him. He owed no man. He was fulfilling his duty as a citizen and bringing up a large family. And there was Higginbotham's cash store, that monument of his own industry and ability. He loved Higginbotham's cash store, as some men loved their wives. He opened up his heart to Martin, showed with what keenness and with what enormous planning he had made the store. And he had plans for it, ambitious plans. The neighbourhood was growing up fast. The store was really too small. If he had more room, he would be able to put in a score of labour-saving and money-saving improvements. And he would do it yet. He was straining every effort for the day when he could buy the adjoining lot and put up another two-storey frame building. The upstairs he could rent, and the whole ground floor of both buildings would be Higginbotham's cash store. His eyes glistened when he spoke of the new sign that would stretch clear across both buildings. Martin forgot to listen. The refrain of work performed in his own brain was drowning the other's clatter. The refrain maddened him, and he tried to escape from it. How much did you say it would cost? he asked suddenly. His brother-in-law paused in the middle of an expectation on the business opportunities of the neighbourhood. He hadn't said how much it would cost, but he knew. He had figured it out a score of times. At the way you lumber it now, he said, four thousand could do it. Including the sign? I didn't count on that. It had just had to come once the building was there. And the ground? Three thousand more. He leaned forward, licking his lips, nervously spreading and closing his fingers, while he watched Martin write a cheque. When it was passed over to him, he glanced at the amount, seven thousand dollars. I yeah, I can't afford to pay more than six percent, he said huskily. Martin wanted to laugh, but instead demanded, How much would that be? Let me see, six percent, six times seven, four hundred and twenty. That would be thirty-five dollars a month, wouldn't it? Higginbotham nodded. Then, if you've no objection, we'll arrange it this way. Martin glanced at Gertrude. You can have the principal to keep for yourself if you'll use the $35 a month for cooking and washing and scrubbing. The 7000 is yours if you'll guarantee that Gertrude does no more drudgery. Is it a go? Mr. Higginbotham swallowed hard. That his wife should do no more housework was an affront to his thrifty soul. The magnificent present was the coating of a pill, a bitter pill. That his wife should not work? It gagged him. All right, then, Martin said. I'll pay the thirty-five a month, and he reached across the table for the cheque. But Bernard Higginbotham got his hand on it first, crying, I accept, I accept. When Martin got on the electric car, he was very sick and tired. He looked up at the assertive sign. The swine, he groaned, the swine, the swine. When Mackintosh's magazine published The Palmist, featuring it with decorations by Berthier and with two pictures by Wen, Hermann von Schmidt forgot that he had called the verses obscene. He announced that his wife had inspired the poem, saw to it that the news reached the ears of a reporter and submitted an interview by a staff writer who was accompanied by a staff photographer and a staff artist. The result was a full page in a Sunday supplement filled with photographs and idealised drawings of Marion, with many intimate details of Martin Eden and his family, and with the full text of the palmist in large type, and republished by special permission of Mackintosh's magazine. It caused quite a stir in the neighbourhood, and good housewives were proud to have the acquaintances of the great writer's sister, while those who had not made haste to cultivate it. Hermann von Schmidt chuckled in his little repair shop and decided to order a new lathe. Better than advertising, he told Marion, and to cost nothing. We'd better have him to dinner, 
she suggested, and to dinner Martin came, making himself agreeable with the fat wholesale butcher and his fatter wife. Important folk, they likely to be of use to a rising young man like Hermann von Schmidt. No lesser bait, however, had been required to draw them to his house than his great brother-in-law. Another man at table who had swallowed the same bait was the superintendent of the Pacific Coast Agencies for the Acer Bicycle Company. Him, von Schmidt, desired to please and propriate because from him could be obtained the Oakland Agency for the Bicycle. So Hermann von Schmidt found it a goodly asset to have Martin for a brother-in-law, but in his heart of hearts he couldn't understand where it all came in. In the silent watches of the night, while his wife slept, he had floundered through Martin's books and poems, and decided that the world was a fool to buy them. And in his heart of hearts, Martin understood the situation only too well, as he leaned back and gloated at von Schmidt's head, in fancy punching it well nigh off him, sending blow after blow home just right. The chuckle-headed Dutchman! One thing he did like about him, however, poor as he was, and determined to rise as he was, he nevertheless hired one servant to take the heavy work off Marion's hands. Martin talked with the superintendent of the Acer agencies, and after dinner he drew him aside with Herman, whom he backed financially for the best bicycle store with fittings in Oakland. He went further, and in a private talk with Herman, told him to keep his eyes open for an automobile agency and garage, for there was no reason that he should not be able to run both establishments successfully. With tears in her eyes and her arms around his neck, Marion, at parting, told Martin how much she loved him and always had loved him. It was true there was a precipitable halt midway in her assertion, which she glossed over with more tears and kisses and incoherent stammerings, and which Martin inferred to be her appeal for forgiveness for the time she had lacked faith in him and insisted on his getting a job. He can't keep his money, that's sure, Hermann von Schmidt confided to his wife. He got mad when I spoke of interest, and he said damn the principal and if I mentioned it again he'd punch my Dutch head off. That's what he said, my Dutch head. But he's all right. Even if he ain't no businessman, he's given me my chance, and he's all right. Invitations to dinner poured in on Martin, and the more they poured, the more he puzzled. He sat, the guest of honour, at an Arden Club banquet, with men of note whom he had heard about and read about all his life. And they told him how, when they had read The Ring of Bells in the Transcontinental and The Perry and the Pearl in the Hornet, they had immediately picked him for a winner. My God, and I was hungry and in rags, he thought to himself. Why didn't you give me a dinner then? Then was the time. It was work performed. If you are feeding me now for work performed, why did you not feed me then when I needed it? Not one word in the Ring of Bells, nor in the Perry and the Pearl, has been changed. No, you're not feeding me now for work performed. You are feeding me because everybody else is feeding me, and because it is an honor to feed me. You are feeding me now because you are herd animals, because you are part of the mob, because the one blind automatic thought in the mob mind just now is to feed me. And where does Martin Eden and the work Martin Eden performed come in all this? He asked himself plaintively, then arose to respond cleverly and wittily to a clever and witty toast. So it went, wherever he happened to be, at the press club, at the Redwood Club, at pink teas and literary gatherings, always were remembered the Ring of Bells and the Perry and the Pearl when they were first published. And always was Martin's maddening and unuttered demand. Why didn't you feed me then? It was work performed. The ring of bells and the perry and the pearl are not changed one iota. They were just as artistic, just as worthwhile then as now. But you are not feeding me for their sake, nor for the sake of anything else I have written. 
You're feeding me because it is the style of feeding just now. Because the whole mob is crazy with the idea of feeding Martin Eden. And often at such times, he would abruptly see slouch in among the company a young hoodlum in square-cut coat and under a stiff rim Stetson hat. It happened to him at the Galena Society in Oakland one afternoon. As he rose from his chair and stepped forward across the platform, he saw stalk through the wide door at the rear of the great room the young hoodlum with the square-cut coat and stiff rim hat. Five hundred fashionably gowned women turned their heads. So intent and steadfast was Martin's gaze to see what he was seeing. But they saw only the empty centre aisle. He saw the young tough lurching down that aisle and wondered if he would remove the stiff rim which never yet had he seen him without. Straight down the aisle he came and up the platform. Martin could have wept over that youthful shade of himself when he thought of all that lay before him. Across the platform he swaggered, right up to Martin, and into the foreground of Martin's consciousness disappeared. The five hundred women applauded softly with gloved hands, seeking to encourage the bashful great man who was their guest. And Martin shook the vision from his brain, smiled, and began to speak. The superintendent of schools, good old man, stopped Martin on the street and remembered him, recalling seances in his office when Martin was expelled from school for fighting. I read your ring of bells in one of the magazines quite a time ago, he said. It was as good as Poe. Splendid, I said at the time. Splendid. Yes, and twice in the months that followed you passed me on the street and did not know me, Martin almost said aloud. Each time I was hungry and heading for the pawnbroker, yet it was work performed. You did not know me then. Why do you know me now? I was remarking to my wife only the other day, the other was saying, wouldn't it be a good idea to have you out to dinner sometime? And she quite agreed with me. Yes, she quite agreed with me. Dinner, Martin said so sharply that it was almost a snarl. Why, yes, yes, dinner, you know, just a potluck with us, with your old superintendent, you rascal, he uttered nervously, poking Martin in an attempt at jocular fellowship. Martin went down the street in a daze. He stopped at the corner and looked about him vacantly. Well, I'll be damned, he murmured at last. The old fellow was afraid of me. Chapter 45 Christ came to Martin one day, Christ of the real dirt, and Martin turned to him with relief to receive the glowing details of a scheme sufficiently wild catty to interest him as a fictitionist rather than an investor. Christ paused long enough in the midst of his exposition to tell him that in most of his shame of the sun he had been a chump. But I didn't come here to spout philosophy, Christ went on. What I want to know is whether or not you will put a thousand dollars in on this deal. No, I'm not chump enough for that, at any rate, Martin answered. But I tell you what I will do. You gave me the greatest night of my life. You gave me what money cannot buy. Now I've got money, and it means nothing to me. I'd like to turn over to you a thousand dollars of what I don't value for what you gave me that night and which was beyond price. You need the money, I've got more than I need, you want it, you came for it, there's no use in scheming it out of me, take it. Christ betrayed no surprise. He folded the check away in his pocket. At that rate, I'd like the contract of providing you with many such nights, he said. Too late, Martin shook his head. That night was the one night for me. I was in paradise. It's commonplace with you, I know, but it wasn't to me. I shall never live at such a pitch again. I'm done with philosophy. I want never to hear another word of it. The first dollar I ever made in my life out of philosophy, Christ remarked as he paused in the doorway, and then the market broke.
Mrs. Morse drove by Martin on the street one day and smiled and nodded. He smiled back and lifted his hat. The episode did not affect him. A month before it might have disgusted him or made him curious and set him to speculating about her state of consciousness at that moment. But now it was not provocative of a second thought. He forgot about it the next moment. He forgot about it as he would have forgotten the central bank building or the city hall after having walked past them. Yet his mind was preternaturally active. His thoughts went ever around and around in a circle. The centre of that circle was work performed. It ate at his brain like a deathless maggot. He awoke to it in the morning. It tormented his dreams at night. Every affair of life around him that penetrated through his senses immediately related itself to work performed. He drove along the path of relentless logic to the conclusion that he was nobody, nothing. Mart Eden, the hoodlum, and Mart Eden, the sailor, had been real. Had been he but Mart Eden. The famous writer did not exist. Martin Eden, the famous writer, was a vapour that had arisen in the mob mind, and by the mob mind had been thrust into the corporeal being of Mart Eaton, the hoodlum and sailor. But it could not fool him. He was not that sun myth that the mob was worshipping and sacrificing dinners to. He knew better. He read the magazines about himself and pored over portraits of himself published therein until he was unable to associate his identity with those portraits. He was the fellow who had lived and thrilled and loved, who had been easy-going and tolerant of the frailties of life, who had served in the forecastle, wandered in strange lands, and led his gang in the old fighting days. He was the fellow who had been stunned at first by the thousands of books in the free library, and who had afterward learned his way among them and mastered them. He was the fellow who had burned the midnight oil and bedded with a spur and written books himself. But the one thing he was not was that colossal appetite that all the mob was bent upon feeding. There were things, however, in the magazines that amused him. All the magazines were claiming him. Warren's Monthly advertised to its subscribers that it was always on the quest after new writers and that, among others, it had introduced Martin Eden to the reading public. The White Mouse claimed him, so did the Northern Review and Macintosh's magazine, until silenced by the Globe, which pointed triumphantly to its files where the mangled sea lyrics lay buried. Youth and age, which had come to life again after having escaped paying its bills, put in a prior claim, which nobody but farmers' children's ever read. The Transcontinental made a dignified and convincing statement of how it first discovered Martin Eden, which was warmly disputed by the Hornet with the exhibit of The Perry and the Pearl. The modest claim of Singletree, Darnley and Co. was lost in the din. Besides, that publishing firm did not own a magazine wherewith to make its claim less modest. The newspapers calculated Martin's royalties. In some way, the magnificent offers certain magazines had made him leaked out, and Oakland ministers called upon him in a friendly way while professional begging letters began to clutter his mail. But worse than all this were the women. His photographs were published broadcast and special writers exploited his strong, bronze face, his scars, his heavy shoulders, his clear, quiet eyes, and the slight hollows in his cheeks like an ascetic's. At this last he remembered his wild youth and smiled. Often among the women he met he would see now one, now another, looking at him, appraising him, selecting him. He laughed to himself. He remembered Brissenden's warning and laughed again. The women would never destroy him, that much was clear. He had gone past that stage. Once, walking with Lizzie toward night school, she caught a glance directed toward him by a well-gowned, handsome woman of the bourgeoisie. The glance was a trifle too long, a shade too considerative. Lizzie knew it for what it was, and her body tensed angrily. Martin noticed, noticed the cause of it, told her how used he was becoming to it and that he did not care anyway. 
You ought to care, she answered with blazing eyes. You're sick. That's what's the matter. Never healthier in my life. I weigh five pounds more than I ever did. It ain't your body. It's your head. Something's wrong with your think machine. Even I can see that, and I ain't nobody. He walked on beside her, reflecting. I'd give anything to see you get over it, she broke out impulsively. You ought to care when women look at you that way. A man like you, it's not natural. It's all right enough for sissy boys, but you ain't made that way. So help me, I'd be willing and glad if the right woman came along and made you care. When he left Lizzie at night school, he returned to the Metropole. Once in his rooms, he dropped into a Morris chair and sat staring straight before him. He did not doze, nor did he think. His mind was a blank, save for the intervals when unsummoned memory pictures took form and colour and radiance just under his eyelids. He saw these pictures, but he was scarcely conscious of them, no more so than if they had been dreams. Yet he was not asleep. Once he roused himself and glanced at his watch. It was just eight o'clock. He had nothing to do, and it was too early for bed. Then his mind went blank again, and the pictures began to form and vanish under his eyelids. There was nothing distinctive about the pictures. They were always masses of leaves and shrub-like branches shot through with hot sunshine. A knock at the door aroused him. He was not asleep, and his mind immediately connected the knock with the telegram or letter, or perhaps one of the servants bringing back clean cloths from the laundry. He was thinking about Joe and wondering where he was, as he said, Come in. He was still thinking about Joe and did not turn toward the door. He heard it close softly. There was a long silence. He forgot that there had been a knock at the door and was still staring blankly before him when he heard a woman's sob. It was involuntary, spasmodic, checked and stifled. He noted that as he turned about. The next instant he was on his feet. Ruth, he said, amazed and bewildered. Her face was white and strained. She stood just inside the door, one hand against it for support, the other pressed to her side. She extended both hands toward him piteously and started forward to meet him. As he caught her hands and led her to the Morris chair, he noticed how cold they were. He drew up another chair and sat down on the broad arm of it. He was too confused to speak. In his own mind, his affair with Ruth was closed and sealed. He felt much in the same way that he would have felt had the Shelley Hot Spring Laundry suddenly invaded the Hotel Metropole with a whole week's washing ready for him to pitch into. Several times he was about to speak, and each time he hesitated. "'No one knows I'm here,' Ruth said in a faint voice, with an appealing smile. "'What did you say?' He was surprised at the sound of his own voice. She repeated her words. "'Oh,' he said, then wondered what more he could possibly say. "'I saw you come in, and I waited a few minutes.' "'Oh,' he said again. He had never been so tongue-tied in his life. Positively, he did not have an idea in his head. He felt stupid and awkward, but for the life of him he could not think of nothing to say. It would have been easier had the intrusion been the Shelley Hot Springs laundry. He could have rolled up his sleeves and gone to work. And then you came in, he said finally. She nodded with a slightly arch expression and loosened the scarf at her throat. I saw you first from across the street when you were with that girl. Oh, yes, he said simply. I took her down to night school. Well, aren't you glad to see me? She said at the end of another silence. Yes, yes, he spoke hastily. But wasn't it rash of you to come here? I slipped in. Nobody knows I'm here. I wanted to see you. I came to tell you I have been very foolish. I came because I could no longer stay away, because my heart compelled me to come, because, because I wanted to come. She came forward, out of her chair and over to him. She rested her hand on his shoulder a moment, breathing quickly, and then slipped into his arms. 
and in his large, easy way, desirous of not inflicting hurt, knowing that to repulse this proffer of herself was to inflict the most grievous hurt a woman could receive, he folded his arms around her and held her close. But there was no warmth in the embrace, no caress in the contact. She had come into his arms and he held her, that was all. She nestled against him, and then, with the change of position, her hands crept up and rested upon his neck. But his flesh was not fire beneath those hands, and he felt awkward and uncomfortable. "'What makes you tremble so?' he asked. "'Is it a chill? Shall I light the grate?' He made a movement to disengage himself, but she clung more closely to him, shivering violently. "'It is merely nervousness,' she said with chattering teeth. I'll control myself in a minute. There, I am better already. Slowly, her shivering died away. He continued to hold her, but he was no longer puzzled. He knew now for what she had come. My mother wanted me to marry Charlie Hapgood, she announced. Charlie Hapgood, that fellow who speaks always in platitudes? Martin groaned. Then he added, And now I suppose your mother wants you to marry me. He did not put it in the form of a question. He stated it as a certitude, and before his eyes began to dance the rows of figures of his royalties. She will not object, I know that much, Ruth said. She considers me quite eligible? Ruth nodded. And yet I am not a bit more eligible now than I was when she broke our engagement, he meditated. I haven't changed any. I'm the same Martin Eden though for that matter I'm a bit worse. I smoke now. Don't you smell my breath? In reply, she pressed her open fingers against his lips, placed them graciously and playfully and in expectancy of the kiss that of old had always been a consequence. But there was no caressing answer of Martin's lips. He waited until the fingers were removed and then went on. I am not changed. I haven't got a job. I'm not looking for a job. Furthermore, I am not going to look for a job, and I still believe that Herbert Spencer is a great and noble man, and that Judge Blount is an unmitigated ass. I had dinner with him the other night, so I ought to know. But you didn't accept Father's invitation, she chided. So you know about that. Who sent him? Your mother? She remained silent. Then she did send him. I thought so. And now I suppose she has sent you. No one knows that I am here she protested. Do you think my mother would permit this? She'd permit you to marry me, that's certain. She gave a sharp cry. Oh, Martin, don't be cruel. You have not kissed me once. You are as unresponsive as a stone. And think what I have dared to do. She looked about her with a shiver, though half the look was curiosity. Just think of where I am. I could die for you. I could die for you. Lizzie's words were ringing in his ears. Why didn't you dare it before? He asked sharply. When I hadn't a job, when I was starving, when I was just as I am now, as a man, as an artist, the same Martin Eden. That's the question I've been propounding to myself for many a day. Not concerning you merely, but concerning everybody. You see, I have not changed though my sudden apparent appreciation in value compels me constantly to reassure myself on that point. I've got the same flesh on my bones, the same ten fingers and toes. I am the same. I have not developed any new strength nor virtue. My brain is the same old brain. I haven't made even one new generalization on literature or philosophy. I am personally of the same value that I was when nobody wanted me and what is puzzling me is why they want me now. Surely they don't want me for myself, for myself is the same old self they did not want. Then they must want me for something else, for something that is outside of me, for something that is not I. Shall I tell you what that something is? It is for the recognition I have received. That recognition is not I. It resides in the minds of others then again for the money I have earned and am earning. But that money is not I. It resides in banks and in the pockets of Tom, Dick and Harry. 
And is it for that, for the recognition and the money, that you now want me? You are breaking my heart, she sobbed. You know I love you, that I am here because I love you. I am afraid you don't see my point, he said gently. What I mean is, if you love me, how does it happen that you love me now so much more than you did when your love was weak enough to deny me? Forget and forgive, she cried passionately. I loved you all the time, remember that, and I am here, now, in your arms. I'm afraid I'm a shrewd merchant, peering into the scales, trying to weigh your love and find out what manner of thing it is. She withdrew herself from his arms, sat upright, and looked at him long and searchingly. She was about to speak, then faltered and changed her mind. You see, it appears this way to me, he went on. When I was all that I am now, nobody out of my own class seemed to care for me. When my books were all written, no one who had read the manuscript seemed to care for them. In point of fact, because of the stuff I had written, they seemed to care even less for me. In writing the stuff, it seemed that I had committed acts that were, to say the least, derogatory. Get a job, everybody said. She made a movement of dissent. Yes, yes, he said, except in your case, you told me to get a position. The homely word job, like so much that I have written, offends you. It is brutal, but I assure you it was no less brutal to me when everybody I knew recommended it to me as they would recommend right conduct to an immoral creature. But to return, the publication of what I had written and the public notice I received wrought a change in the fibre of your love. Martin Eden, with his work all performed, you would not marry. Your love for him was not strong enough to enable you to marry him. But your love is now strong enough, and I cannot avoid the conclusion that its strength arises from the publication and the public notice. In your case, I do not mention royalties, though I am certain that they apply to the change wrought in your mother and father. Of course, all this is not flattering to me, but worst of all, it makes me question love, sacred love. Is love so gross a thing that it must feed upon publication and public notice? It would seem so. I have sat and thought upon it till my head went around. Poor dear head! She reached up a hand and passed the fingers soothingly through his hair. Let it go around no more. Let us begin anew, now. I loved you all the time. I know that I was weak in yielding to my mother's will. I should not have done so. Yet I have heard you speak so often with broad charity of the fallibility and frailty of humankind. Extend that charity to me. I acted mistakenly. Forgive me. Oh, I do forgive, he said impatiently. It is easy to forgive where there is really nothing to forgive. Nothing that you have done requires forgiveness. One acts according to one's lights, and more than that one cannot do. As well might I ask you to forgive me for my not getting a job. I meant well, she protested. You know that I could not have loved you and not meant well. True but you would have destroyed me out of your well-meaning. Yes, yes, he shut off her attempted objection. You would have destroyed my writing and my career. Realism is imperative to my nature, and the bourgeois spirit hates realism. The bourgeoisie is cowardly. It is afraid of life, and all your effort was to make me afraid of life. You would have formalized me, you would have compressed me into a two-by-four pigeonhole of life, where all life's values are unreal and false and vulgar. He felt her stare protestingly. Vulgarity and hearty vulgarity, I'll admit, is the basis of bourgeois refinement and culture. As I say, you wanted to formalize me, to make me over into one of your own class, with your class ideals, class values, and class prejudices. He shook his head sadly. And you do not understand, even now, what I am saying.
My words do not mean to you what I endeavor to make them mean. What I say is so much fantasy to you. Yet, to me, it is vital reality. At the best, you are a trifle puzzled and amused that this raw boy, crawling up out of the mire of the abyss, should pass judgment upon your class and call it vulgar. She leaned her head wearily against his shoulder, and her body shivered with recurrent nervousness. He waited for a time for her to speak, and then went on. And now you want to renew our love. You want us to be married. You want me. And yet, listen, if my books had not been noticed, I'd nevertheless have been just what I am now, and you would have stayed away. It is all those damned books. Don't swear, she interrupted. Her reproof startled him. He broke into a harsh laugh. That's it, he said. At a high moment, when what seems your life's happiness is at stake, you are afraid of life in the same old way, afraid of life and healthy oath. She was stung by his words into realization of the puerility of her act, and yet she felt that he had magnified it unduly and was consequently resentful. They sat in silence for a long time, she thinking desperately and he pondering upon his love which had departed. He knew now that he had not really loved her. It was an idealized Ruth he had loved, an ethereal creature of his own creating, the bright and luminous spirit of his love poems, the real bourgeois Ruth, with all the bourgeois failings and with all the hopeless cramp of bourgeois psychology in her mind, he had never loved. She suddenly began to speak. I know that much you have said is so, I have been afraid of life. I did not love you well enough. I have learned to love better. I love you for what you are, for what you were, for the ways even by which you have become. I love you for the ways wherein you differ from what you call my class, for your beliefs which I do not understand, but which I know I can come to understand. I shall devote myself to understanding them, and even your smoking and your swearing, they are part of you, and I will love you for them too. I can still learn. In the last ten minutes I have learned much. That I have dared to come here is a token of what I have already learned. Oh, Martin! She was sobbing and nestling close against him. For the first time his arms folded her gently with his sympathy, and she acknowledged it with a happy movement and a brightening face. It is too late, he said. He remembered Lizzie's words. I am a sick man. Oh, not my body. It is my soul, my brain. I seem to have lost all values. I care for nothing. If you had been this way a few months ago, it would have been different. It is too late now. It is not too late, she cried. I will show you. I will prove to you that my love has grown that it is greater to me than my class, and all that is dearest to me, all that is dearest to the bourgeoisie, I will flout. I am no longer afraid of life. I will leave my father and mother and let my name become a byword with my friends. I will come to you here and now, in free love, if you will, and I will be proud and glad to be with you. If I have ever been a traitor to love, I will now, for love's sake, be a traitor to all that made that earlier treason. She stood before him with shining eyes. I am waiting, Martin, she whispered, waiting for you to accept me. Look at me. It was splendid, he thought, looking at her. She had redeemed herself for all that she had lacked, rising up at last, true woman, superior to the iron rule of bourgeois convention. It was splendid, magnificent, desperate. And yet, what was the matter with him? He was not thrilled nor stirred by what she had done. It was splendid and magnificent only intellectually. In what should have been a moment of fire, he coldly appraised her. His heart was untouched. He was unaware of any desire for her. Again, he remembered Lizzie's words. I am sick, very sick he said with a despairing gesture. How sick, 
I did not know till now. Something has gone out of me. I have always been unafraid of life, but I never dreamed of being sated with life. Life has so filled me that I am empty of any desire for anything. If there were room, I should want you now. You see how sick I am. He leaned his head back and closed his eyes, and, like a child crying that forgets its grief in watching the sunlight percolate through the tear-dimmed films over the pupils, so Martin forgot his sickness, the presence of Ruth, everything, in watching the masses of vegetation shot through hotly with sunshine that took form and blazed against this background of his eyelids. It was not restful, that green foliage. The sunlight was too raw and glaring. It hurt him to look at it, and yet he looked, he knew not why. He was brought back to himself by the rattle of the doorknob. Ruth was at the door. How shall I get out? she questioned tearfully. I am afraid. Oh, forgive me, he cried, springing to his feet. I'm not myself, you know. I forgot you were here. He put his hand to his head. You see, I'm not just right. I'll take you home. We can go out by the servant's entrance. No one will see us. Pull down that veil and everything will be all right. She clung to his arm through the dim lighted passages and down the narrow stairs. I am safe now, she said, when they emerged on the sidewalk, at the same time starting to take her hand from his arm. No, no, I'll see you home, he answered. No, please don't, she objected. It is unnecessary. Again, she started to remove her hand. He felt a momentary curiosity. Now that she was out of danger, she was afraid. She was in almost a panic to be quit of him. He could see no reason for it and attributed it to her nervousness. So he restrained her withdrawing hand and started to walk on with her. Halfway down the block, he saw a man in a long overcoat shrink back into a doorway. He shot a glance in as he passed by, and, despite the high-turned-up collar, he was certain that he recognised Ruth's brother, Norman. During the walk, Ruth and Martin held little conversation. She was stunned. He was apathetic. Once he mentioned that he was going away, back to the South Seas, and once she asked him to forgive her having come to him. And that was all. The parting at her door was conventional. They shook hands, said good night, and he lifted his hat. The door swung shut, and he lighted a cigarette and turned back for his hotel. When he came to the doorway into which he had seen Norman shrink, he stopped and looked in a speculative humour. She lied, he said aloud. She made believe to me that she had dared greatly, and all the while she knew the brother that brought her here was waiting to take her back. He burst into laughter. Oh, these bourgeois! When I was broke, I was not fit to be seen with his sister. When I have a bank account, he brings her to me. As he swung on his heel to go on, a tramp going in the same direction begged him over his shoulder. Say, mister, can you give me a quarter to get a bed? were the words, but it was the voice that made Martin turn around. The next instant he had Joe by the hand. Do you remember that time when we parted at the hot springs? The other was saying. I said then we'd meet again. I felt it in my bones, and here we are. You're looking good, Martin said admiringly. And you've put on weight? I sure have, Joe's face was beaming. I never knew what it was to live till I hit Hoboin. I'm thirty pounds heavier and feel tip-top all the time. Why, I was working to skin and bone in them old days. Hoboin sure agrees with me. But you're looking for a bed just the same, Martin chided. And it's a cold night. Huh? Looking for a bed? Joe shot a hand into his hip pocket and brought it out filled with small change. That beats hard graft, he exulted. You just looked good. That's why I battered you. Martin laughed and gave in. You've several full-size drunks there, he insinuated. Joe slid the money back into his pocket. Not in mine, he announced. No getting ori eyed for me.
though there ain't nothing to stop me except I don't want to. I've been drunk once since I seen you last, and then it was unexpected, being on an empty stomach. When I work like a beast, I drink like a beast. When I live like a man, I drink like a man. A jolt now and again when I feel like it, and that's all. Martin arranged to meet him next day and went on to the hotel. He paused in the office to look up steamer sailings. The Mariposa sailed for Tahiti in five days. Telephone over tomorrow and reserve a stateroom for me, he told the clerk. No deck stateroom, but down below, on the weather side, the port side. Remember that, the port side. You'd better write it down. Once in his room, he got into bed and slipped off to sleep as gently as a child. The occurrences of the evening had made no impression on him. His mind was dead to impressions. The glow of warmth with which he met Joe had been most fleeting. The succeeding minute he had been bothered by the ex-laundryman's presence and by the compulsion of conversation. That in five more days he sailed for his loved South Seas meant nothing to him. So he closed his eyes and slept normally and comfortably for eight uninterrupted hours. He was not restless. He did not change his position, nor did he dream. Sleep had become to him oblivion, and each day that he awoke, he awoke with regret. Life worried and bored him, and time was a vexation. Chapter 46 Say, Joe, was his greeting to his old-time working mate next morning. There's a Frenchman out on 28th Street. He's made a pot of money and he's going back to France. It's a dandy, well-appointed, small steam laundry. There's a start for you if you want to settle down. Here, take this, buy some clothes with it and be at this man's office by 10 o'clock. He looked up the laundry for me and he'll take you out and show you around. If you like it and think it's worth the price, 12000 let me know and it's yours. Now run along, I'm busy. I'll see you later. Now look here, Maud, the other said slowly with kindling anger. I come here this morning to see you. Savvy, I didn't come here to get no laundry. I come here for a talk for old friend's sake and you shove a laundry at me. I tell you what you can do. You can take that laundry and go to hell. He was out of the room when Martin caught him and whirled him around. Now look here, Joe, he said. If you act that way, I'll punch your head. And for all friends' sake, I'll punch it hard. Savvy? You will, will you? Joe had clinched and attempted to throw him, and he was twisting and writhing out of the advantage of the other's hold. They reeled about the room, locked in each other's arms, and came down with a crash across the splintered wreckage of a wicker chair. Joe was underneath, with arms spread out and held and with Martin's knee on his chest. He was panting and gasping for breath when Martin released him. Now we'll talk a moment, Martin said. You can't get fresh with me. I want that laundry business finished first of all. Then you can come back and we'll talk for old sake's sake. I told you I was busy. Look at that. A servant had just come in with the morning mail a great mass of letters and magazines. How can I wade through that and talk with you? You go and fix up that laundry, and then we'll get together. All right, Joe admitted reluctantly. I thought you was turning me down, but I guess I was mistaken. But you can't lick me, Mart. In a stand-up fight, I've got the reach on you. We'll put the gloves on sometime and see, Martin said with a smile. Sure, as soon as I get that laundry going. Joe extended his arm. You see that reach? It'll make you go a few. Martin heaved a sigh of relief when the door closed behind the laundryman. He was becoming antisocial. Daily he found it a severe strain to be decent with people. Their presence perturbed him, and the effort of conversation irritated him. They made him restless, and no sooner was he in contact with them than he was casting about for excuses to get rid of them. He did not proceed to attack his mail, and for half an hour he lolled in his chair, doing nothing, while no more than vague, half-formed thoughts occasionally filtered through his intelligence, or rather, at wide intervals, themselves constituted the flickering of his intelligence. He roused himself and began glancing through his mail. 
There were a dozen requests for autographs. He knew them at sight. There were professional begging letters, and there were letters from cranks, ranging from the man with the working model of perpetual motion and the man who demonstrated that the surface of the earth was the inside of a hollow sphere, to the man seeking financial aid to purchase the peninsula of Lower California for the purpose of communist colonization. There were letters from women seeking to know him, and over one such he smiled, for enclosed was her receipt for a pew rent, sent as evidence of her good faith and as proof of her respectability. Editors and publishers contributed to the daily heap of letters, the former on their knees for his manuscripts, the latter on their knees for his books. His poor disdained manuscripts that had kept all he possessed in pawn for so many dreary months in order to fund them in postage. There were unexpected checks for English serial rights and for advance payments on foreign translations. His English agent announced the sale of German translation rights in three of his books and informed him that Swedish editors, from which he could expect nothing because Sweden was not a party to the Berne Convention, were already on the market. Then there was a nominal request for his permission for a Russian translation, that country being likewise outside the Berne Convention. He turned to the huge bundle of clippings which had come in from his press bureau and read about himself and his vogue, which had become a furore. All his creative output had been flung to the public in one magnificent sweep. That seemed to account for it. He had taken the public off its feet the way Kipling had, that time when he lay near to death and all the mob, animated by a mob mind thought, began suddenly to read him. Martin remembered how that same world mob, having read him and acclaimed him and not understood him in the least, had, abruptly, a few months later, flung itself upon him and torn him to pieces. Martin grinned at the thought. Who was he that he should not be similarly treated in a few more months? Well, he would fool the mob. He would be away in the South Seas, building his grass house, trading for pearls and copra, jumping reefs in frail outriggers, catching sharks and bonitas, hunting wild goats among the cliffs of the valley that lay next to the valley of Teahoe. In the moment of that thought, the desperateness of his situation dawned upon him. He saw, clear-eyed, that he was in the valley of the shadow. All the life that was in him was fading, fainting, making toward death. He realized how much he slept, and how much he desired to sleep. Of old, he had hated sleep. It had robbed him of precious moments of living. Four hours of sleep in the twenty-four had meant being robbed of four hours of life. How he had grudged sleep. Now, it was life he grudged. Life was not good. Its taste in his mouth was without tang and bitter. This was his peril. Life that did not yearn toward life was in fair way toward ceasing. Some remote instinct for preservation stirred in him, and he knew he must get away. He glanced about the room, and the thought of packing was burdensome. Perhaps it would be better to leave that to the last. In the meantime, he might be getting an outfit. He put on his hat and went out, stopping in at a gun store, where he spent the remainder of the morning buying automatic rifles, ammunition, and fishing tackle. Fashions changed in trading, and he knew he would have to wait till he reached Tahiti before ordering his trade goods. They could come up from Australia anyway. This solution was a source of pleasure. He had avoided doing something, and the doing of anything just now was unpleasant. He went back to the hotel gladly, with a feeling of satisfaction in that the comfortable Morris chair was waiting for him, and he groaned inwardly on entering his room at the sight of Joe in the Morris chair. Joe was delighted with the laundry. Everything was settled, and he would enter into possession next day. Martin lay on the bed with closed eyes while the other talked on. Martin's thoughts were far away, so far away that he was rarely aware that he was thinking. It was only by an effort that he occasionally responded, and yet this was Joe 
whom he had always liked. But Joe was too keen with life. The boisterous impact of it on Martin's jaded mind was a hurt. It was an aching probe to his tired sensitiveness. When Joe reminded him that sometime in the future they were going to put on the gloves together, he could almost have screamed. Remember, Joe, you had to run the laundry according to those old rules you used to lay down at Shelley Hot Springs, he said. No overworking, no working at night, and no children at the mangles. No children anywhere, and a fair wage. Joe nodded and pulled out a notebook. Look here, I was working out them rules before breakfast this a.m. What do you think of them? He read them aloud, and Martin approved, worrying at the same time as to when Joe would take himself off. It was late afternoon when he awoke. Slowly the fact of life came back to him. He glanced about the room. Joe had evidently stolen away after he had dozed off. That was considerate of Joe, he thought. Then he closed his eyes and slept again. In the days that followed, Joe was too busy organising and taking hold of the laundry to bother him much. And it was not until the day before sailing that the newspapers made the announcement that he had taken passage on the Mariposa. Once, when the instinct of preservation fluttered, he went to a doctor and underwent a searching physical examination. Nothing could be found the matter with him. His heart and lungs were pronounced magnificent. Every organ, so far as the doctor could know, was normal and was working normally. There is nothing the matter with you, Mr. Eden, he said. Positively, nothing the matter with you. You are in the pink of condition. Candidly, I envy you your health. It is superb. Look at that chest. There, and in your stomach, lies the secret of your remarkable constitution. Physically, you are a man in a thousand. In ten thousand, barring accidents, you should live to be a hundred. And Martin knew that Lizzie's diagnosis had been correct. Physically, he was all right. It was his think machine that had gone wrong and there was no cure for that except to get away to the South Seas. The trouble was that now, on the verge of departure, he had no desire to go. The South Seas charmed him no more than did bourgeois civilization. There was no zest in the thought of departure, while the act of departure appalled him as a weariness of the flesh. He would have felt better if he were already on board and gone. The last day was a sore trial, Having read of his sailing in the morning papers, Bernard Higginbotham, Gertrude, and all the family came to say goodbye, as did Hermann von Schmidt and Marion. Then there was business to be transacted, bills to be paid, and everlasting reporters to be endured. He said goodbye to Lizzie Connolly abruptly at the entrance to night school and hurried away. At the hotel, he found Joe. Too busy all day with the laundry to have come to him earlier. It was the last straw, but Martin gripped the arms of his chair and talked and listened for half an hour. You know, Joe, he said, that you are not tied down to that laundry. There are no strings on it. You can sell it any time and blow the money. Any time you get sick of it and want to hit the road, just pull out. Do what you will to make you the happiest. Joe shook his head. No more road in mine, thank you kindly. Holborn's all right except him for one thing, the girls. I can't help it, but I'm a ladies' man. I can't get along with Adam, and you've got to get along with Adam when you're hoboing. The times I've passed by houses where dances and parties was going on and heard the women laugh and saw their white dresses and smiling faces through the windows. Gee, I tell you, them moments was plain hell. I like dancing and picnics and walking in the moonlight and all the rest too well. Me for the laundry and a good front, with big iron dollars clinking in my jeans. I seen a girl already, just yesterday, and you know, I'm feeling already I'd just as soon marry her as not. I've been whistling all day at the thought of it. She's a beaut, with the kindest eyes and softest voice you ever heard. Me for her, you can stack on that. Say... Why don't you get married with all this money to burn? You could get the finest girl in the land. 
Martin shook his head with a smile, but in his secret heart he was wondering why any man wanted to marry. It seemed an amazing and incomprehensible thing. From the deck of the Mariposa, at the sailing hour, he saw Lizzie Connolly hiding in the skirts of the crowd on the wharf. Take her with you, came the thought. It is easy to be kind. She will be supremely happy. It was almost a temptation one moment, and the succeeding moment it became a terror. He was in a panic at the thought of it. His tired soul cried out in protest. He turned away from the rail with a groan, muttering, Man, you are too sick. You are too sick. He fled to his stateroom, where he lurked until the steamer was clear of the dock. In the dining saloon, at luncheon, he found himself in the place of honour, at the captain's right, and he was not long in discovering that he was the great man on board. But no more unsatisfactory great man ever sailed on a ship. He spent the afternoon in a deck chair, with closed eyes, dozing brokenly most of the time, and in the evening went early to bed. After the second day, recovered from seasickness, the full passenger list was in evidence, and the more he saw of the passengers, the more he disliked them. Yet he knew that he did them an injustice. They were good and kindly people, he forced himself to acknowledge, and in the moment of acknowledgement he qualified good and kindly like all the bourgeoisie, with all the psychological cramp and intellectual futility of their kind. They bored him when they talked with him. Their little superficial minds were so filled with emptiness, while the boisterous high spirits and the excessive energy of the younger people shocked him. They were never quiet, ceaselessly playing deck quoits, tossing rings, promenading, or rushing to the rail with loud cries to watch the leaping porpoises and the first schools of flying fish. He slept much. After breakfast, he sought his deck chair with a magazine he never finished. The printed pages tired him. He puzzled that men found so much to write about, and puzzling, dozed in his chair. When the gong awoke him for luncheon, he was irritated that he must awaken. There was no satisfaction in being awake. Once he tried to arouse himself from his lethargy and went forward into the forecastle with the sailors. But the breed of sailors seemed to have changed since the days he had lived in the forecastle. He could find no kinship with these stolid-faced, ox-minded, bestial creatures. He was in despair. Up above, nobody had wanted Martin Eden for his own sake and he could not go back to those of his own class who had wanted him in the past. He did not want them. He could not stand them any more than he could stand the stupid first cabin passengers and the riotous young people. Life was to him like strong, white light that hurts the tired eyes of a sick person. During every conscious moment, life blazed in a raw glare around him and upon him, It hurt. It hurt intolerably. It was the first time in his life that Martin had travelled first class. On ships at sea, he had always been in the forecastle, the steerage, or in the black depths of the coal hold, passing coal. In those days, climbing up the iron ladders out of the pit of stifling heat, he had often caught glimpses of the passengers, in cool white, doing nothing but enjoy themselves under awnings spread to keep the sun and wind away from them, with subservient stewards taking care of their every want and whim. And it had seemed to him that the realm in which they moved and had their being was nothing else than paradise. Well, here he was, the great man on board, in the midmost centre of it, sitting at the captain's right hand, and yet vainly harking back to Forecastle and Stoke Hall in quest of the paradise he had lost. He had found no new one, and now he could not find the old one. He strove to stir himself and find something to interest him. He ventured the petty officer's mess and was glad to get away. He talked with the quartermaster off duty 
an intelligent man who promptly prodded him with the socialist propaganda and forced into his hands a bunch of leaflets and pamphlets. He listened to the man expounding the slave morality, and as he listened, he thought languidly of his own Nietzsche philosophy. But what was it worth, after all? He remembered one of Nietzsche's mad utterances wherein that madman had doubted truth. And who was to say? Perhaps Nietzsche had been right. Perhaps there was no truth in anything, no truth in truth, no such thing as truth. But his mind wearied quickly, and he was content to go back to his chair and doze. Miserable as he was on the steamer, a new misery came upon him. What when the steamer reached Tahiti? He would have to go ashore. He would have to order his trade goods to find a passage on a schooner to the Marquesas to do a thousand and one things that were awful to contemplate. Whenever he steeled himself deliberately to think, he could see the desperate peril in which he stood. In all truth, he was in the valley of the shadow, and his danger lay in that he was not afraid. If he were only afraid, he would make toward life. Being unafraid, he was drifting deeper into the shadow. He found no delight in the old familiar things of life. The Mariposa was now in the northeast trades, and this whine of wind surging against him irritated him. He had his chair moved to escape the embrace of this lusty comrade of old days and nights. The day the Mariposa entered the doldrums, Martin was more miserable than ever. He could no longer sleep. He was soaked with sleep, and perforce he must now stay awake and endure the white glare of life. He moved about restlessly. The air was sticky and humid, and the rain squalls were unrefreshing. He ached with life. He walked around the deck until that hurt too much, then sat in his chair until he was compelled to walk again. He forced himself at last to finish the magazine, and from the steamer library he culled several volumes of poetry, but they could not hold him, and once more he took to walking. He stayed late on deck after dinner, but that did not help him, for when he went below he could not sleep. This surcease from life had failed him. It was too much. He turned on the electric light and tried to read. One of the volumes was a Swinburne, he lay in bed, glancing through its pages, until suddenly he became aware that he was reading with interest. He finished the stanza, attempted to read on, then came back to it. He rested the book face downward on his breast and fell to thinking. That was it, the very thing. Strange that it had never come to him before. That was the meaning of it all. He had been drifting that way all the time, and now Swinburne showed him that it was the happy way out. He wanted rest, and here was rest awaiting him. He glanced at the open porthole. Yes, it was large enough. For the first time in weeks he felt happy. At last he had discovered the cure of his ill. He picked up the book and read the stanza slowly, aloud. From too much love of living, from hope and fear set free, we thank with brief thanksgiving, whatever gods may be, that no life lives forever, that dead men rise up never, that even the weariest river winds somewhere safe to see. He looked again at the open port. Swinburne had finished the key. Life was ill, or rather, it had become ill, an unbearable thing. That dead men rise up never. That line stirred him with a profound feeling of gratitude. It was the one beneficent thing in the universe. When life became an aching weariness, death was ready to soothe away to everlasting sleep. But what was he waiting for? It was time to go. He arose and thrust his head out the porthole looking down into the milky wash. The mariposa was deeply loaded, and, hanging by his hands, his feet would be in the water. 
he could slip in noiselessly. No one would hear. A smother of spray dashed up, wetting his face. It tasted salts on his lips, and the taste was good. He wondered if he ought to write a swan song, but laughed the thought away. There was no time. He was too impatient to be gone. Turning off the light in his room so that it might not betray him, he went out the porthole feet first. His shoulders stuck and he forced himself back so as to try it with one arm down by his side. A roll of the steamer aided him and he was through, hanging by his hands. When his feet touched the sea, he let go. He was in a milky froth of water. The side of the mariposa rushed past him like a dark wall, broken here and there by lighted ports. She was certainly making time. Almost before he knew it, he was astern, swimming gently on the foam-crackling surface. A bonita struck at his white body, and he laughed aloud. It had taken a piece out, and the sting of it reminded him of why he was there. In the work to do, he had forgotten the purpose of it. The lights of the mariposa were growing dim in the distance, and there he was, swimming confidently, as though it were his intention to make for the nearest land a thousand miles or so away. It was the automatic instinct to live. He ceased swimming, but the moment he felt the water rising above his mouth, the hand struck out sharply with a lifting movement. The will to live was his thought, and the thought was accompanied by a sneer. Well, he had will. I will strong enough that with one last exertion it could destroy itself and cease to be. He changed his position to a vertical one. He glanced up at the quiet stars, at the same time emptying his lungs of air. With swift, vigorous propulsions of hands and feet, he lifted his shoulders and half his chest out of water. This was to gain impetus for the descent. Then he let himself go and sank without movement, a white statue into the sea. He breathed in the water deeply, deliberately, after the manner of a man taking an anaesthetic. When he strangled, quite involuntarily, his arms and legs clawed the water and drove him up to the surface and into the clear sight of the stars. The will to live, he thought disdainfully, vainly endeavouring not to breathe the air into his bursting lungs. Well, he would have to try a new way. He filled his lungs with air, filled them full. This supply would take him far down. He turned over and went down head first, swimming with all his strength and all his will. Deeper and deeper he went. His eyes were open and he watched the ghostly, fluorescent trails of the darting Benita. As he swam, he hoped that they would not strike at him, for it might snap the tension of his will. But they did not strike, and he found time to be grateful for this last kindness of life. Down, down he swam till his arms and leg grew tired and hardly moved. He knew that he was deep. The pressure on his eardrums was a pain, and there was a buzzing in his head. His endurance was faltering, but he compelled his arms and legs to drive him deeper until his will snapped and the air drove from his lungs in a great explosive rush. The bubbles rubbed and bounded like tiny balloons against his cheeks and eyes as they took their upward flight. Then came pain and strangulation. The hurt was not death, was the thought that oscillated through his reeling consciousness. Death did not hurt. It was life, the pangs of life, this awful, suffocating feeling. It was the last blow life could deal him. His willful hands and feet began to beat and churn about, spasmodically and feebly. But he had fooled them and the will to live that made them beat and churn. He was too deep down. They could never bring him to the surface. He seemed floating languidly in a sea of dreamy vision. Colours and radiances surrounded him and bathed him and pervaded him. What was that? 
It seemed a lighthouse, but it was inside his brain, a flashing, bright white light. It flashed swifter and swifter. There was a long rumble of sound, and it seemed to him that he was falling down a vast and interminable stairway. And somewhere at the bottom he fell into darkness. That much he knew. He had fallen into darkness. And at the instant he knew, he ceased to know. The End